Greetings everyone and welcome back to the bench. Time to move ahead with the discrete audio amplifier project. Getting into the measurement stage means we're getting closer to wrapping this thing up. At least I hope so. Well in this video I'm going to discuss a bunch of measurements that I've already taken and then after that I'm going to set this thing up in its little heat sink jig and take some measurements of its damping factor at three different frequencies. The next video I produce on this amplifier will be about its short circuit protection and the following video will be distortion measurement. That's one measurement I haven't done yet and it's going to take a video of its own. I have to figure out a few things. I need to figure out how I can get low distortion measurements even if I can. I can't do that with my oscilloscope of course. It just, you know, I can't read values low enough. But that was part of the whole design is to have a very low distortion. Like I said initially, I'm not going after the super really ridiculously low numbers. I'm going after still very good hi-fi numbers that make this amplifier hopefully be something that people would be interested in. Now I, it has 13 transistors on it. It's, it's moderately complex for a 60 watt at 8 ohms or around 100 watt at 4 ohms. You know, if you look at amplifiers from the 70s, you know, the old receivers or the amplifiers that were rated around 60 watts in the 8 ohms, they probably had somewhere between 7 and 9 transistors in them. And this design, using the best practices of some of the renowned amp designers like Cordell and Doug Self and a few other people I've looked at uh, hopefully come up with an amplifier that uh, is very good for not being super complex. So kind of keeping my fingers crossed on the distortion. You know, that's the end game there. I, you know, I hope it's low enough. You know, if it doesn't quite meet what I want, I don't think I'm going to monkey with this. It's just going on long enough. Uh, not really too much I could tweak without redoing the circuit. So, yeah, crossing my fingers on that. Okay, so let's talk about some of the measurements. Okay, John Audio Tech Amp. Kind of thinking of a name for this project. Like they have a code name for prototype things. I'm um, kind of thinking of a name that I can use, like the Snickers or something like that. I don't know if I want to use that because... That's a copyrighted product, the candy bar. So, you know, I'm not sure I want to do that. But if you have any good ideas, I'd appreciate it. Okay, so the Miller capacitance that I took all the measurements with is set at 100 picofarads. You can take it a bit lower if you want, maybe down to 82 or 75 or something like that. I wouldn't go lower than that even though the amplifier is probably going to be stable but if you want a higher slew rate I don't know why you would need anything more than uh, what this amp is now you could uh, tinker with that and go with a lower value the first thing I checked was peaking when I was checking the frequency response what I would like to see is the amplifier have a nice response and then start to roll off it some high frequency. I do not want to see it peak up and then roll off. That means there could be a stability issue. And there was no peaking. It stayed nice and flat till it rolled off. And what dictates the upper frequency response of the amplifier is this Miller capacitance. Measured bandwidth. This is the pole to pole measurement. In other words, from the 3 dB down at the low frequency to the 3 dB down at the high frequency. And um, I measured it at 4 hertz at the low end and 290 kilohertz at the high end. And that's measured at 4 volts with a 4 ohm load, in other words, 4 watts. When you're measuring the frequency response, you don't want to measure it at full power because you run into slew rate limiting and the sine wave will start to turn into a triangle wave so you know you're hitting slew rate limiting and you're not going to see the actual frequency response plus it's, you really couldn't measure that because running the amp at a high frequency at high power you'll you can burn out 
some components like the uh, the Zobel network or the Bougereau cell as they call it on the output. But yeah, this is the uh, frequency response of the amplifier. And if you're just popping in and you wonder why it has to go so far beyond hearing, well, that was covered in a previous video. Um, I don't know, two or three videos back on this uh, project. So there's a very good reason why amplifiers have to have that high frequency response. The gain of the amplifier is 22.1 which is 26.8 decibels. The uh, audio frequency response range, um, which means I'm measuring the deviation from 0 dB. And 0 dB is just an arbitrary value you set where the, you know, the frequency is, or I should say the output signal is at some level and you measure how it drops off. And at 20 hertz, it was down negative 0.2 dB, very small, and that was because of the input coupling capacitor. Now when I took this measurement, I didn't have the input RF capacitor installed, but I wouldn't suspect it would make much of a difference that I could measure at 20 kilohertz. So the frequency response is pretty much flat. You know, no way is anybody going to hear 0.2 decibels. Slew rate, talked about that in a previous video where it was only at 10 volts per microsecond and I wanted that to be a little bit faster so I, uh, well not a little bit but twice as fast so I boosted it up to 20 volts per microsecond by increasing the current on the input stage because this Miller capacitor is what dictates what the slew rate is depending on the current in the input stage. And I was running it too low, so I boosted that up. Uh, offset voltage I measured at less than 40 millivolts. There's not going to be any way to adjust the offset voltage on this amp. A lot of amplifiers don't have that control. Aside from the larger power resistors used on the board, all the small signal resistors are 1%. I just do basic mat transistor matching. Uh, you, there's not going to be an issue with offset voltage with this amplifier. And, well, we get to the damping factor, and uh, I'm going to measure it at 20 hertz, 1 kilohertz, and 20 kilohertz. So we'll get the amplifier set up on the jig, and we'll take some measurements. Okay, I have the amp clampulated into its little heat sink jig here. 8 ohm non-inductive load. I uh, have the power supply hooked up to the rail stiffening capacitors. Hook it up to the scope here. So what I do is I measure the output voltage without a load and then I connect the load and get a measurement. Then I can run through and do the calculations to see what the damping factor is. So let me get this thing set up and the camera pointed at the oscilloscope and I'll go from there. Okay, I have the field tech waveform generator set up for 20 kilohertz and we'll use 10 volts as our base voltage to start out with. Okay, that's unloaded and I'll connect the 8 ohm load and it does not change just like the LM1875 when I tried to measure it let me make sure that I'm actually connected well the current is going up on this power supply so it is definitely connecting I cannot measure <laughs> with this oscilloscope it's not changing So, uh, having three digits to work with, that'd make the damping factor over a thousand, at least a thousand. So, yeah, I can't really measure it with my equipment. I can't use a meter. I know they don't go that high in frequency. But I'll just carry on and measure the rest of the frequencies and see what I get there. 
Okay, we're at one kilohertz. 10 volts. Connect the load. Does not change at all. Yep, it's uh, changes on the power supply, the current draw. No difference. Just so you can see what I'm doing, I'm connecting this wire to the output, and you can see as I connect that. Wait a minute, it's hard to do this with the camera. One handed here. See, the current goes up, but the voltage stays the same. When I disconnect that, you know, the voltage drops. Warmed up a little bit, the bias will settle out, but yeah, it does not change. Okay, so now we're at 20 hertz. And I'll connect the resistor. Of course, we're starting at 10 volts. And it's connected, and it does not change. So what does that mean? Well, the good news is negative feedback has complete control of this amplifier and it's good to see that at 20 kilohertz because I know you know if I didn't have good control of the amplifier I wouldn't have good control of it as far as distortion goes as well so it's good to see that at 20 kilohertz and you know with these output emitter resistors 0.22 you would expect to see some voltage drop but again, that's negative feedback adjusting the amplifier to bring that voltage right back to what it should be. So that's the power of negative feedback. So the amplifier has a damping factor of over a thousand or around a thousand. Let's pretend for a moment that the amplifier did have a small change. The minimum resolution that I could measure. And it, let's say it dropped from 10 volts to 9.99 that's a 0 0.01 volt change so with 9.99 divided by 8 we get about 1.25 amps Well, you might be saying, well, I have this big, expensive, fancy amplifier, and it has a damping factor of 200 or something like that. How can this cheap little board amplifier have, have a higher damping factor? Am I cheating? Well, actually, a little bit. Here's the deal. I'm able to put the scope probes right on the board, right at the output. I have another connection to ground that doesn't carry any current so uh, it's kind of like one of those Kelvin connections where you where it allows you to measure the voltage accurately by probing with non-current carrying wires in an actual commercially produced amplifier there's going to be wires that run out to the speaker terminals you know in some amps it, it might run up to a speaker switch up front and then back to the output terminals and there's going to be a significant resistance on those wires so what they're doing is probably measuring the amplifier right at its output terminals where in my case I'm measuring it right on the amp board at this point in time I don't know how long the leads would be to the output terminals if I put it in a case or something like that plus I want to see how in control this amplifier or negative feedback has it and very glad to see that it has very good control of the amplifier at 20 kilohertz because there wasn't a change in the voltage and that's to be expected because that's why the amplifier's bandwidth is so large so it has plenty of loop gain to work with at 20 kilohertz so negative feedback has very good control of the amplifier at that frequency so yeah I'm hoping that distortion is going to be low at 20 kilohertz as well now I wanted to answer a question somebody had about uneven supply rail voltages. What happens to the amplifier? To do this I hooked it up to my Radio Shack dual supply which allows me to adjust it quicker. 
for this demonstration. So let me get the camera back at the scope here. So, how does it affect the amplifier? It doesn't bother it at all. See, I'm turning down the positive rail now. Eventually, it's going to start clipping. There it is. All it does is clip on the rail first with the lower supply voltage. I'll turn that back up and adjust the negative supply rail. And it just clips on the bottom rail. And I turn down the top rail. It'll clip on top now. Turn that back up. So if I turn the top rail down all the way, it shuts off. Let's try the bottom rail. If I turn that down all the way, it shuts off as well. And turn it back up. Of course, I get a square wave when I turn them low because I'm chopping the waveform so much. What about offset voltage? Does that affect that? Let's turn the uh, signal off and measure the offset voltage and see what happens. Okay. Let's measure the offset voltage. Right now, it's at 33 millivolts. So I will turn the positive rail down to about half measured again. And it's still pretty close. It's 32.6. So why is the offset voltage unaffected with uneven supply rails? Well, that has to do with... Let me get, you, get this schematic into the shot here. This resistor on the input is ground referenced. So the input is referenced to zero ground. And if you use your op amp theory, that's what you're going to get out. And you know, we have no signal when I measure the offset voltage. So this input is at ground potential, which is zero. So that's what we get on the output. Now, of course, there is that slight offset due to uh, small errors in the amplifier. But at that level, it's nothing to worry about. So hopefully that answers the question about what happens when the supply rails are uneven. It, a summary of that answer is nothing really. It just it doesn't really affect the amplifier except that it will clip first on the rail that has the lower voltage. Well, there's a nice shot of my messy bench. The amp board goes back on the mountain of components. It's going to go under the soldering iron for some changes coming up. And that'll do it for this one. Thanks for watching.